And what a trip that had turned out to be. And now today I have to follow a professional interviewer to moderate this panel to follow Ernie, but I'll give it my best shot. We're gonna stay tight and on schedule, so we're gonna, this session's gonna be a little shorter than planned, so we're gonna keep moving at a rather brisk pace and hopefully um, um, gather some wonderful information from our illustrious panel. We're gonna start first with short introductions, and I'm gonna let them do that, and we'll start with Dean and go right down. All right. Dean Muse, the Director of Visual and Performing Arts for Clear Creek Independent School District. I'm Jen Berardino, and I'm the manager of the Kinder Foundation Education Center, which is a public learning space for our visitors within the museum. Um, I oversee professional development, a curriculum called Learning Through Art Elementary. I'm also developing a Learning Through Art Element or Middle School program. And just to give you a real brief introduction to the museum, the museum was started in 1900 by a group of educators, so I think that really shows a commitment to where education falls within our institution. Um, we also have a dedicated education department of 18 full-time staff members to really develop experiences for museum visitors of all ages that really un start to explore what what it means to use a work of art in the galleries and to see the world through a broader view, through time and space through our galleries. My name is Long Chu. I'm the Associate Director for Writers in the Schools. I am a poet and uh, I've been with the organization for uh, 15 years. Um, and what we do at Writers in the Schools is, uh, you know, we send poets and fiction writers and playwrights, folks that are in love with the craft of writing out into the community and schools and uh, various mm -hmm. places to work with children to get them invested in the writing process from a, a personal sort of uh, angle. So. And my name is Tina Angelo and I'm the Director of Professional Development for Writers in the Schools and I just joined the group actually in April um, after having been in education for 37 years uh, as a, a teacher who had a writer on my campus. And so my role is to be that school part of Writers in the Schools, bring that kind of landscape both to uh, the, the writers that we work with and the teachers that we work with. And uh, if you would tolerate tolerate me for a uh, sort of personal story. I have Tina Angelo sitting next to me. I kind of want to give a shout out, and Dean Moots is here. He's with Clear Creek ISD, but give a shout out to Clear Creek ISD and Dr. Greg Smith, the superintendent. Uh, I'm a product of that, of that district. I am uh, a uh, Vietnamese immigrant. I'm an ESL student. And Tina Angelo was my 10th grade English teacher. <laughs> we wanted to be sure to let you know. <laughs> and Mary Lou Johnson, was my 10th grade art teacher. And those two teachers allowed me to be the writer and the poet that I am today. They actually um, steered me away from being a doctor to my parents' chagrin. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. so, so my line is always, be very good to your students because someday they might be your bosses. So it's, <laughs> it's very important to have student engagement and a relationship. <laughs> That's great. Of course, we're all about, with the partners, about building these partnerships between the arts organizations and our schools. Uh, and let's go down the row and do this one, then we'll sort of do free for all. And we'll start with you again, Dean, about how did you develop the successful partnerships that you've formed thus far? All right. Um, I'll talk about this partnership first because I think it's just a good illustration of um, just a key role that we play as fine arts directors in our districts, but also as administrators, um, because it takes the administrators in the district to really say yes to these opportunities when they're seen. Jenny called me and she said, I have this program that I'm doing, I'm looking for a school, and um, we'd like to come out to a school and present, and we'd like to get some of their teachers interested in this particular program. And it was, it's enhancing the way these teachers and their core academic teachers, the way they teach their subject. And so I was very interested in it. So the first thing that I had to do in my mind and what I want to model to everybody else is I had a lot of other things on my plate at the time. And this could have been one of those conversations where I said, I'll see what I can do and then let it fall off my plate or get buried in my plate. But you, it's so important and I'm so glad that I didn't let this particular opportunity fall off my plate. 
And so I thought about which school I would call, and I decided to call Westbrook Intermediate, and I talked to Dr. Lori Broughton up there, the principal. And she, you know, I said, we have these people from the museum that want to come down and get your teachers and see if your teachers would be interested in this. Dr. Lori Broughton has a lot on her plate. She's trying to run a school, and she could have let this slip off of her plate. And she's also very careful about who she lets out in front of her faculty. And if you're gonna have a faculty meeting, you're gonna bring somebody in from the outside, you kind of know what, wanna know exactly what they're gonna say and what they're going to do because we've been uh, burned a time or two in our life <laughs> by having people in that position. <clears throat> but she trusted me and she, um, she said, you know what, I have a faculty meeting coming up. Um, they can come out and speak to my faculty. And I was like, awesome. So I called Jenny back. I said, I have a faculty for you. She came out, did the presentation. Teachers went after it. They got very excited, and now they're a part of this, uh, this consortium that's putting this, this uh, curriculum for middle school together, and, and um, they're having a great time, and they're very enthused about it. That stuff won't happen unless we say yes to these opportunities, and so that's what I'm encouraging everybody here to do, is to say yes and to also seek out these opportunities with the arts organizations. I think to build on that a little bit too, um, it really comes down to understanding that we have a shared expertise. Um, we really understand the expertise that the teachers and the schools bring to the table and we're not asking you to do something out of your air comfort zone, so to speak. But I think also that Dean recognizes the expertise of the museum staff that were trained educators to work with original works of art and infuse those into the curriculum in a really meaningful, positive way that doesn't add to the school day. And so I think there's a trust here that starts to develop over time when we both understand that we're experts in our field and that we are much more powerful when we work together and bring the, that expertise to the table equally to develop a partnership. And uh, writers into schools, yeah, you know, I'm not, um, we, we don't have a specific uh, project to talk about. Really, our entire organization is about collaboration. The name itself is a metaphor for collaboration. Um, we bring poets and fiction writers into schools to work in existing ELA classrooms, but also in other classrooms, in art classrooms, in history classrooms, to get students really uh, um, excited about writing. And, and for me, personally, uh, this is not uh, just a job. It's clearly a mission uh, for someone who grappled with the English language from the ground up and to fall in love with it so much that I became a poet, said uh, a lot about, about the power of uh, attachment through uh, reading and writing. Uh, and so we, we collaborate extensively with schools whenever we do a project. It's a year-long kind of project, either 26 or 32 weeks. What a school gets is a writer in residence who will work with designated classrooms and teachers to align um, <coughs> the teaching of poetry and creative writing to the existing um, curriculum and so we plan a lot in the beginning we sort of create very individualized projects uh, everything ends up in a in a, a publication so students know what it means to get the work published and a reading celebration um, so yeah we were about the entire writing process and I think that what has made the partnerships that we've developed with campuses successful and continue to be successful is that in the planning meetings that Long alluded to, we really go in and listen to the campuses. What is it that the campus has a vision for? Because many times we find principals have a very distinct vision. I want to create a writing culture. I want my teachers to have a greater sense of efficacy as a writing teacher, um, whatever the vision is. And so we really go in there and listen to what it is they want to create. And, and we're able to be flexible enough and still true to our mission to make that happen. And it might sometimes be that we reach out to another uh, art partner. You know, we might reach out to uh, an artist to come in and, and help. Um, and then the other thing is, as we're listening, 
we have a roster of 80 professional writers that we work with and we place. So we don't just place, go down and say, well, here are our writers and we'll just make these little lines and connect them with schools. We're listening to the vision of the administration and of the teachers and leaving the meetings and going, you know, this would be perfect for so-and-so because he likes, you know, so we're really matching a writer to join the community of that campus. And I think that really makes all the difference in um, a partnership. We're a dating service. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we have a roster of 80 writers. Who do you want? <laughs> um, and, and so it really is, it really is about uh, a collaborative community mm -hmm. um, and our projects cannot work without the participation of teachers and administrators um, and uh, yeah we, mm -hmm. we it, it's about sharing. Jennifer I'm gonna direct this to you first uh, <clears throat> can you give us a few specifics about one of your programs uh, exactly what you're doing in the schools and is it designed by you and your staff are by the teachers in the school and to what degree is the collaboration there? Sure, um, so we have, we have partnerships with districts all over the place. I mean, we really work with probably over 50 districts. We see every third grader in the museum for tours from Clear Creek as well as HISD. We see um, every fourth grader from Spring Branch and Galena Park to come on tours with us. But the project I think that um, I would like to talk more specifically about is our Learning Through Art Middle School Curriculum Development Project. And this is the project that te um, Dean and I have been working with each other and that he's really put me in touch with some of his best educators and certainly his best principals. So we were, a, the museum was awarded a grant about a year ago to develop an arts integrated curriculum for middle school teachers. Um, and this really came out of a need that we saw in our galleries and on our tours and in our current professional development offerings that we just weren't tackling middle school teachers the way we wanted to. Um, we have hefty programming for elementary level educators as well as their students and high school. Um, but middle school was the one that just kept growing. There was a percolation there. And so we got together sort of um, as a department and determined that this was the next audience that we really wanted to work directly with. And so based on our elementary level curriculum of the same name, Learning Through Art, um, we really started to reach out to the schools to determine what it means to be a middle school student in Houston, to be a middle school teacher. And what does it mean for the, the museum to support that work? And what we learned is that it's less about the content from our point of view. You all can be the content experts. Um, and what we can really do in the museum is start to develop thinking habits, learning dispositions, um, and really start to develop habits of mind while looking at works of art. And this plays in directly to what's happening in the classrooms. Um, so we have formed a group of 18 teachers from across Houston, made up of teachers from social studies, math, science, language arts, and of course art. And those teachers are working with myself and my colleagues over the next three years to determine how we use works of art to develop thinking habits that then will only reinforce learning in the classroom. Um, and part of that is really, it's a collaboration be between us and those teachers. And so while the museum instigated the grant, it was really coming from a need from the schools. I, I think that we are very responsive to what's happening in the districts and happening in the classrooms because of our long-term relationships with educators. Right. Anybody else want to follow on that? Uh, the, the idea of uh, <clears throat> creating a writing culture, as Tina alluded to, is exactly what we want to accomplish in schools. It, it, for us, it's, um, uh, it's, it's getting kids to think of writing uh, and reading, of course, but writing um, uh, as something that exists beyond testing, beyond the sort of walls of uh, the schools. And so um, for us, uh, writing is a kind of lifeline for some of these students um, to write down their stories and, and to write down their, their thoughts and do it uh, well through revising, through editing, to, through actually, actually learning a craft. Uh, that, that is where the collaboration 
existence. You know, what, what's, what's nice about us, we're, we're a medium-sized organization. We're moving into our 30th year of existence. We were founded out of the uh, UH Creative Writing Program. Um, but uh, I think that what's nice about us is that we're, we're flexible and we're able to create and shift our projects according to what each school, each culture needs. And a specific example um, that comes to mind is actually a planning meeting with an elementary school that Long and I actually went to yesterday. And we've had a relationship with this campus for like, I don't know, six years or so. And they have new principal. And um, they were at that point of saying, are we going to continue to spend the money for writers in the schools or not? And the PTO president goes, you know, we started wondering what are we... Um, how are we growing through this? You know, at this point, it's kind of been a standalone, um, almost an ancillary program. And we work with them. The, the principal said, you know, we, we have new teachers on board who know the organization of how to write, but they don't really know the author's craft. I would really like for them to grow. So we reconfigured the 26 sessions that we're going to have on that campus so that every third or fourth session that writers going to be working with the teachers and the the students portfolios that they keep their wits writing in will now actually be part of the the data that that teachers can look at with the writer and look how are our students growing where do they need more help so our our um, writers, we have to pick very carefully for this particular project because they can't come in and say, here's my curriculum for your campus. It's going to be based on the reaction of the kiddos, the needs of the teachers, and so we're building that into the 26-week program that they're going to have. And uh, I want to just say from my vantage point that um, these relationships are not easy to build. And um, they go against human nature. If you take four language arts teachers and put them in a room and say, collaborate, they're at it. I mean, they're just going nuts. You put a language arts teacher, a history teacher, a science teacher, and a math teacher, and an art teacher in the same room and say, collaborate, they're looking at each other like, uh, what do we do? Um, it goes against human nature to reach out and build bonds with people that are different from you and don't see eye to eye and don't have the same goals. And so a lot of times we look at these programs and, and we put these people together and we say, collaborate, and they don't. And so after the first meeting, we say, well, that's just not going to work. And so we don't worry or try that anymore. But it's critical. It's just like learning how to, um, people come up to me and they say, you can speak to children. You talk to children, have a conversation with children. You know, how do you do that? I just can't talk to kids. I don't know what to ask them. And I said, I've talked to 700 million kids and I was terrible the first 150,000 times I tried to do it too but you just have to keep pushing through and you finally develop those skills and so these teachers are not used to collaborating cross-curricularly and integrating arts into what they're trying to do and, and building on that thinking but you can't give up after one try you have to push through and that's why this excites me this is a three-year process of building this particular collaboration. And so I know that that collaboration is just going to, to really be well settled, and those teachers are going to eventually open up and really be able to discuss the possibilities and the potential. And when that happens across our district and across Houston with the arts organizations and our districts, it's going to be very powerful, and that's what we're all looking for. Pre preconceived uh, ideas of arts organizations sometimes can be a challenge uh, in terms of building partnerships. Are there any particular myths out there that you can debunk, of which many of us may be fearful, that really in reality are, should not be a concern? I mean, one that immediately comes to mind from the art museum's perspective is that art can only teach the humanities. And I mean, I think Dean was just alluding to this a little bit that where does science and math fit into the museum experience? And you know, it's pretty easy for us to say that we can teach language arts and um, writing skills. We can teach looking skills and social studies pretty easily in our galleries. But again, where does the science and math fit into this? This is our biggest challenge always. 
And I, I think the way to really understand it is that what happens in our galleries, an experience with an original work of art, is really problem solving at its finest. Um, we, through the process of uncovering a work of art, what we're asking our visitors, our students, our teachers to do is to persevere against something that they might not know about. about. You walk up to an original work of art, you don't know what you're looking at, you could just walk away, but instead we're asking you to slow down and think critically and look, consider your bias and assumptions and have that grit and tenacity to persevere until you get to a place of understanding, which is what we're asking our students in our science labs to do. We start with simple things like observation and collecting data much like the scientific process, this is what we do in our galleries. Um, before we can ever get to a conclusion, we're asking students in our galleries to form a hypothesis about a work of art. So I think the connection is actually pretty clear when it comes to science. Um, an interesting story is I was having dinner at Rice for, with the math department. I don't, I'm not sure how I got on that list, but I was invited to have dinner with a group of mathematicians at Rice University. And I was sitting next to a professor of applied mathematics. So this is one of those professors who works on, you know, those really long, complicated um, math problems on the chalkboard and you just have to keep working on it. And I said to him, you know, what, is it, what does it look like to be really successful in math? from your point of view. What are the characteristics of success? And he said to me, you have to have problem solving skills, a willingness to fail, and tenacity, which is exactly what we teach in our galleries. You have to be able to walk up to a work of art and say, I don't know what this is, but I'm gonna just put an idea out there, right? And so I, it's the same types of problem solving skills. It's the habits of mind that we develop in a museum experience that will prove to be successful for your students beyond the content that's being taught in your class. It's the overarching critical thinking skills that it, what it means to be successful in the 21st century. And that goes beyond the classroom. It's the well-rounded individual who can understand math and writing at the same level and also understand a work of art. And a work of art can provide that critical component for somebody who doesn't understand math at its first approach, at, at their first approach, and push through that problem until you get to a place of understanding. And um, maybe one of the myths is that uh, poets and artists are sort of uh, solo creatures who work in the dark and, and uh, um, you know, that, that, that we don't collaborate well and that we maybe we don't even think about data or surveys or research. And, and, and we at Writers in the Schools, we actually have done um, now 10 years of research and, 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 and we have found that with students demonstrate improved writing skills, uh, uh, self-efficacy, standardized test scores, creativity, of course. But we also have, for example, the Environmental Writing Project, where we um, not only uh, um, uh, put a writer in, in those classrooms to sort of get kids to think about the genre of nature writing, um, and, and really metaphor exists because of the natural world anyway, um, you know, we, we also bring them out to, into the uh, Houston Arboretum. We get them to walk around, look at, at trees, think about that, come back to the classrooms and, 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 and take those field notes and write the wonderful essays and poems. And, and what we have found in our, in our um, uh, um, evaluation is that science test scores in Stanford and TACS um, for those students who have had the WITS project outscore the students um, without the WITS project in similar demographics. And the residual effect is actually carries over to the next year, too. Um, so it's, you know, we, we think about these things quite seriously. Um, uh, we uh, definitely, we're not just, um, uh, you know, fly-by-night sort of uh, uh, poets uh, out in the hinterworld there. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, another myth that um, people have, educators sometimes, about creative writing is, well, that's fluff. You know, I don't have time for fluff because I've got star and I've got teaks. And um, the, the truth of the matter is what we have to, to impress upon um, educators is that 
we all have a story to tell. Whether you become an engineer someday, a salesman someday, a doctor someday, you have to be able to tell that story. So it is important to know how to communicate to an audience, how to choose words purposefully for a particular audience to create a particular effect. You can be, uh, as you were alluding, the smartest person in the room, not the wisest. You can be the smartest person in the room and not be able to tell your story well enough to get that job or, or whatever it is. So, so I think that uh, creative writing is really essential for students to learn how to communicate what they want to tell to others. And, and also for teachers, Creative writing is a way, let's say for example, a writer comes to your classroom and teaches your kiddos how to do a haiku. Well, in science class, if you're an elementary self-contained teacher, you can say, you know your exit ticket for today? We studied a particular scientific concept. Write a haiku about it. You can, that engages the students. You as a teacher use that as a checking for understanding point and they have um, used the skill they learned with the uh, wits writer in a different um, uh, discipline. So it's kind of important for our writers to be able to help teachers make those connections. You know, a, a follow through with this lesson I did today is you might want to think about this, 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 other ways of using it. Right. Uh, the elephant in the room, and as we all know, is budget and money. Um, can you share a little bit about how your projects have been funded and what kind of obstacles you had to overcome or hurdles to jump to, um, to get things moving? We, we write a lot of grants. Um, we, we write all the time. Um, and, and, um, and we think very seriously about schools that, that, that can or cannot afford our project, our typical project is $1,800 for a year-long project in a classroom. Now, we actually have written grants to reduce that cost for Title I schools to about $1,500, and even further reduce it with, with uh, uh, schools with free and reduced lunch at 60% plus to $1,000 per classroom. And with supporters uh, this year, uh, with uh, um, a very specific project from Schlumber J, some schools are paying $150 per classroom. And so it's not unaffordable and we work with schools very seriously to plan the cost piece of it as well. I mean the museum certainly falls within the same constraints that um, Long was just talking about and I think what's important to remember is that you know if we're looking at money as a barrier we're sort of just turning our hands away and saying okay well we're done because there's never going to be enough time or money. Just that's the reality of it, a unless we're really committed to a project. And I think there's a couple of different ways. I mean, the project that we're currently working on with the middle school students is a, it's a grant funded project that came through the museum, um, but we're then working with the <coughs> districts. I think a lot of it has teachers, is teachers reaching out to the organization saying, I really want to do this. What type of flexibility is there in terms of creating something? Here's my budget, big, small, or somewhere in between, and how can we make something happen? And then I think there are always the district-supported projects. As administrators, I mean, our dis the districts are applying for grant money, DOE money. We know those are out there floating around. Um, and I think it's important to remember to come to your arts partners as partners on those grants, because we can help in developing that grant and we can also be um, a partner within the process of executing that grant. And I think uh, this is one of the key issues that brought us all together in the Houston Arts Partners also, was that if you go to a philanthropist and you say, I, I, I'd love to have some money to, to integrate some arts into the school district, um, and you don't have any background knowledge or you, know, you can't really give them anything concrete, it's hard for a philanthropist to say yes to those things without getting more information. And so we felt like if we built this, this uh, website and we, we formed this partnership with these different organizations, and now you have school districts named on there and you have arts partnerships named and you have sponsors and underwriters named on this thing. 
And you can go to a philanthropist and people out there that have monies and grants, and you can say, you know, this is a part of uh, what Houston is trying to do, and, and we're stepping forward, and we're trying to set the, you know, the bar for the rest of the world and show how we can come together. And um, I think philanthropists and people out there that have money are going to be more excited and more committed to those types of situations. And it's like Dr. Tim said, you know, we can either look at that, the challenges, and we can not look at them as opportunities, or we can, we can rise above them and push ahead. Both of your organizations have had fairly long uh, longevity in, in terms of your partnerships. Uh, what's your secret? I'll, I'll stress again that because this is the Houston Arts Partners Conference and the, the panel is about collaborative partnerships, it is the partnership piece of it that has sustained us. And, and we are very, very uh, serious about creating collaborative partnerships that are successful, that are creative, that really will enrich students' lives, and not only in the partnerships with schools that we work with, but partnerships with other arts organizations. For example, we have a project that we collaborate with Aurora Picture Show, the Micro Cinema Group, where we t uh, uh, place a, a um, filmmaker and a writer together so students can create these deep writing pieces and then turn those into stop animation film. I mean, what kid wouldn't get excited about, about that kind of work? We have a project with the camera, for example, where they will come in and get kids and, you know, good luck, get them excited about John Cage and Steve Reich, right? <laughs> a very complicated kind of music, but they are bringing in a witch poet, for example, to get kids to be introduced to language poetry, to found poetry, through wordplay, so that they can take risks and understand what it means to select a word and choose it for the sound of it. And so um, the, 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 those sorts of collaborations, and we're here at the MFA, we have a project called Writing on Location, where we take students through museums. We work with the MFA on this. We work with the Manil Collection and Blaffer Art Gallery, where they take writing tours of these art sites. And so, yeah, it's about the, the partnerships. Well, and I think that, as I mentioned earlier, as we customize for our campuses, we're aware of the partnerships that are available to us within this organization. So <clears throat> we can not necessarily turn down a campus. We can say, you know, we need to bring in someone else with this. It, and, and I think that's good. Yeah, I think the real uh, one of the crux of this is really crafting a shared experience. Um, you know, I mentioned this at the beginning, I think it's really recognizing the fact that teachers and schools bring a, set, a certain set of expertise to the table, as does the museum or any other art par arts partners, and sort of where is the meeting of the minds, and how do we create something using that expertise at the table that both benefits both organizations in our co common goals and vision, essentially. And when you listen to these people speak, how would you not want to have a long-term relationship with them? <laughs> I mean, they're awesome to be around, but they're speaking our lingo, um, the educational lingo, and they know what they're talking about. And, and they're not just about art hanging in a museum, but it's about understanding um, how the mind works and how it's expanded through observation. And uh, we have um, different levels, you know, when we think about the arts, and. Sometimes we bring kids, we bring our third graders to the museum and we take our fifth graders to the symphony and we expose them to the arts. And we have fine arts groups on our campuses and these kids take these classes on the arts and they learn about the arts. But, you know, we're talking the next level up where we're starting to look at the benefits that we've seen in these fine arts groups and we're trying to apply them to how we teach and how we understand learning with our children and really do something significant. And so. That's going to take a long time to develop, and um, we're trying to show also that we are in this for the long term and that we have close relationships with these people throughout. It's not just Clear Creek. It's all the fine arts directors and all the districts around this area do have incredible relationships with the people um, in the fine arts organizations, and they're there for your using. And so administrators out there in the different districts um, it's a, it's a very well-coordinated group, and it's just ready to be utilized, and so that's what we're trying to encourage you to do. We're down to like one minute, but I've <laughs> got to ask this question. <laughs> is there any 
and you've got 30 seconds each. <laughs> is there any hard data that you've been, in these days of high stakes accountability, is there any kind of hard data that you have been able to collect that speaks to the uh, impact, positive impact of your partnerships? The short answer to that is yes. We have hard data, <laughs> but I'm not gonna talk about the hard data because I can get that email to you if you want. But there, like what Dr. Tim has alluded to, we have a human need to create. It is not a coincidence that iambic pentameter sounds like the human heartbeat. There is a need for us to be attached to the, the arts and, 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 and create and write stories and tell people who we are through, through, through this process of creativity. And, and so I know that we are talking to a group of educators and administrators that already believe in this, but we need you to spread the word. We need you to, to, to show other people that there, there, there is a place for, for um, creativity to exist. And, and there are lots of folks that are willing uh, to make it happen. Um, sure, I, as Long said, there's plenty of data out there, but I also think that um, what we can really start to talk about is the qualitative process as well. Um, through this middle school grant, um, it's essentially an action-based research project for the museum. We're really looking at how educators' attitudes start to change about using works of art both in the museum and in their classrooms. And so over the period of three years, and hopefully a little longer, we'll get to know how that starts to transform a teacher's experience. And in fact, we're working with a teacher who's been teaching for 32 years, and you know, she was a little hesitant. She said she really wanted to be a part of the project, but she just wasn't sure how this was gonna work out for her. And after a three-day summer institute, she said that it has completely transformed her teaching. She's using works of art in her classroom in a way that she's never thought about them before, and she can't wait to incorporate different works of art into her classroom in new and unusual ways. I do have a little hard data. Even though my left, <laughs> left thumb went over my right, I'm going to be a hard data person here. Um, but we did have an experience with a, a large high school in uh, Houston that came to us and said, we are seeing negative growth. Uh, point, um, I think it was 4.3 negative growth in their reading scores. So they brought us in to work with their entire ninth grade ELA uh, faculty. And we worked with their faculty and with their students. And because our um, lesson cycle is bringing in an anchor text, reading it, having literary analysis of it, and then writing about it. Their, uh, their test scores that year for reading went up. Uh, so they had a uh, plus 4.8 percent growth after that one year of working, uh, us working with their teachers. But we, we customized that just for them because that was the need they had, that was the data they were working with, and so it worked. Awesome. Dean, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, they took my 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to get well, it, it's some truly exciting opportunities for all of us as educators. And uh, I kept thinking while you were talking back to the College Board study I mentioned, it's all about engaging and engagement of students in learning. And what a better path. And uh, congratulations to the partnership and for your presence, and certainly join me in thanking our panel for this.